Then we'll get started here. Our Father in heaven, we're thankful for the opportunity we have to be here to serve our community, and we're grateful for our many blessings. We ask thy spirit to be with us as we deliberate this evening, that the things we say and do will be in accordance with thy mind and will, that will benefit our community, and we ask thy blessings now in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. We'll call this meeting order and, and welcome those in the that are presenting delegations and standards here and and Delberts and Alex. Thank you, Corey, for the media. Um, additions and adoptions of the agenda. Are there any? I want to just chat about uh, a conference that I need to attend just for a moment. Okay, we'll okay. add that down. To need to get approval for seventy. Seventy. Okay. So, Councillor Corey, you need to have a vote on the addition. Yes. And then we'll yes. The <coughs> All right. Can we have a vote on the addition that Councillor Barnes would like to speak to us about a conference? All in favor. So we have to bring that up. Sure, I'll bring that up. Okay, that's fine. All in favor? Opposed? Now, can we have an adoption of the agenda, please, Councillor Brown? to adopt the agenda of the fourth day of February 2020. Thank you. All in favor? And opposed? None. Okay, I have a delegation. Mr. Delbert Beezer is going to speak to us on the golf course fundraising. He sent a previous letter so you'll be able to see some of the concerns you may have. And uh, we can have a discussion on that. So, Delbert, it's all yours. I'll try and talk loud enough. Picked up this cold last night and started losing my voice all day. So You're in good company because half of us have that. So. Told, the, told the secretary, just don't let me answer any questions today. I'm afraid it'll, Anyways, last, it'll probably last three weeks, I'm just warning you. <laughs> Is that how long it lasts? I just don't fight it, but anyhow. I hope not. Thank you, uh, first of all, Council, for letting me come and uh, discuss some items in this letter I sent you. Uh, I met with Jeff uh, a week ago or ten days ago about these and we discussed uh, quite a few of these bullets and and uh, I think Kim and I are on the same page as far as the bullets are concerned so I'm just looking forward uh, I'm I'm in the position we're in the position to form the association and I just wanted to make sure that all our ducks were in a row before I do that and uh, so there's these bullet points are something that I feel like are important for the association along with uh, the uh, possibility of this project of building this community facility at the golf course. Um, I want it to be a success and so therefore I don't want to stick my neck out on the road and let it be run over a number of times and so most of these bullets address those concerns. So I just like to go through them bullet by bullet and then we can discuss them if you want to. Uh, ownership of the project, uh, so the building my understanding is the building will belong to the town. It's on town property uh, during and after construction. But I'd just like to understand exactly when that ownership changes. So my concern there is that we get halfway through the project and council changes or a committee member changes and all of a sudden the direction has changed. And so um, I'd just like to have some not definite timelines, but at least an understanding with the town council and with administration about when they see that ownership happening. Um, yeah, until it's completed. So until the ribbon cutting, essentially, then uh, the project would be under the association's handling is how I'd like to see it. Delbert, can I ask you something? Yeah, yep, go ahead. So, who then is in charge of insuring that project that is on our land? Yeah, so... Uh, that becomes an Jeff, issue, right? Yeah, Jeff brought that up, and uh, I've talked to an insurance agent. We can buy builder's insurance, which general contractors have and any buildings they're doing. Um, that would protect the building site uh, for insurance. Uh, the liability, I'm not sure, and, and we talked with Jeff, and... I think we'll have to work that out as far as general liability around the construction site because there's going to be a period. <clears throat> my timelines are hoping that we'll be able to start this coming fall uh, once the golf course is ready to close and, and try and get the cement work done before snow flies and, and then we can work on the structure. So there's going to be a crossover when <coughs> I'd like no public to be there 
while we're building, but there may be a crossover point. There is another question, if you, if you may. Since that building would become the ownership of the town, how is a town overseeing the specs that are normally <coughs> go into building something that then is given to yeah. the town? How so, is, where is the oversight? Who does that? Yeah, so that's a little later on in the bullets. I've got that question asked. Cause, uh, so I, Would that. it not be better if we let him, let him go through the bullets? Write, you down, do that? Okay. write down your questions yeah. and it's then we okay. can go back to that. No problem. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so the second bullet is, is the same thing. The towns understand the decision-making process for the construction from start to finish. So uh, the concept, uh, some of you councillors, and I brought actually brought brought the drawing this is a conceptual thing of course but if you wanted to hand those out Jeff, yeah. there's a <coughs> foot, footprint on the back and that, yeah oh, God. Okay. the conceptual drawing uh, can be changed from size so it can be made larger or smaller depending on two things in my mind. One is the fundraising we do. Uh, if, if I can't raise enough funds to build the bigger plan, then we're going to have to downsize it for the smaller plan. The, the committee that Jeff and I talked about, uh, who's going to be overseeing this with my association, uh, he suggested that it not be the golf committee. Okay. And so I suggested to him that it be two or three councillors that, that meet with our association to oversee the approval of this concept before we start. So if council, for example, I, if I say I've only got $500,000 and I can build this size and council says, you know, if we added another 10 feet, we could have a full length bowling alley in the basement, then that would be a decision council will have to make. And we either have to postpone it for more fundraising or council would have to decide how they wanted to handle that. So the, the concept is to, to have a full basement under there and uh, if not bowling lanes, then we'll be doing, we're looking at some reality uh, golf booths and also some gaming booths. There's talk of uh, um, not a fitness club, but uh, something similar to that. Uh, there's even talk of pickleball, but I'm not a pickleball guy, so I don't know how much room is needed for height for pickleball, so... Delbert, we work be in the before you go any farther, have you got any idea of the square footage right now of this, this concept building, length and width and so forth? Yeah, I do somewhere here. Because it's not anywhere on your diagrams. No, that the square footage isn't on there. there. Again, if we could save those questions till the, yeah. after the presentation, write down your, whatever questions you may it have. It was, what si you remember what size it was? Yeah. 15,000, I think. It's 100 by 50, I think, is what the building is itself is. I'm not counting the, the uh, deck around the outside. So jurisdictional, uh, it's on town property. I know permitting is required. Uh, I'd just like to make sure that I know what permitting is needed. Uh, there was talk originally of an environmental study for uh, soil samples and stuff for the structure. Those have been done previously, and I just don't know if those existing ones are good enough. If the town's going to demand other ones, that's one of the things I'd like to know ahead of the time uh, before I start start fundraising for it. And then that same same section, we talk about who all, who the committee, the association will be reporting to, whether it's council as a whole, the golf committee, or special committee of council which is the best way I see it happening if, if uh, two or three councillors were assigned to, to sit in the association with our group for that uh, jurisdictional stuff. Uh, clear understanding what the town is willing to provide for services. Uh, so when I say services there, I'm talking about sewer, water, gas, power, uh, landscaping, those kind of services that uh, the town can provide. So just want to be clear on who's paying for those. Uh, possession, we talked about already. Uh, it's natural to, for anyone to feel like something belongs to them, especially if it is something that has been worked hard at. My purpose is to build this community facility and provide this needed facility. No ulterior motives. 
uh, and there's none that, for anybody involved in the project. So the contractors I've talked to, uh, the volunteers I've already had committed are, are doing this for the community. Um, they don't want their brass plaque on the wall. It's, it's uh, totally fundraised and, and volunteered to do it. So uh, there will be corporate donations uh, from out of town and uh, their main concern to me is that we'll contribute if we can see it benefiting the community. They don't just want to be given cash for something that uh, doesn't help the community out. And so that's why I, I feel like this needs to not be called the golf clubhouse. It needs to be a community facility that has a golf pro shop in it that's benefiting the community. The financial accounting, Jeff and I talked about this already. Um, the finance fundraising will be done by me. We'll probably be, and, and Jeff and I are working on those details on the, on the charitable tax receipts. That'll be something we'll have to work out how best that works. The, the Rotary Clubs in the past, Jeff mentioned, have different hoops they have to cross. To, to make that eligible for the town to give those receipts. So we'd, we would work on that. Um, I would hope the association would be allowed to, to run the financial accounting for the building and take care of all of those financial costs and reporting to count, town council and those councillors on that committee. You make a statement in there about transparency from the town. I assume that's yeah. been solved. Uh, it's been better, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What, what do you so. mean better? Well, so... A true accounting, and I've been on council before, and we've gone this with this golf course when we bought the golf course back when, and town council, not the town council, town people always felt like the golf course was costing the taxpayers a pile of money. And my feeling is show the public what the facilities are costing, whether it's the swimming pool, the ice center, the soccer field, whatever it is, show the true cost. And because I know all those facilities we're losing money on. Uh, the golf course, yes, we lost some money on this year, but the town also put some money in, some capital money. If they wouldn't have put that capital money in, it'd be pretty close to breaking even this year. And, and that's what I mean by transparency. So do you want the town to put a statement out? Uh, no, I just... People can, people can access the financial records of the yep. town pretty much, right? Yeah. Yeah. So. It's just, it's an understanding, it's a, a misnomer, I guess, maybe... Whenever the town, town's people, taxpayers like myself, see the town spending money, they think they're spending it foolishly. And as we get older, like I am, uh, my kids stop using recreation facilities. And so I thought, I'm paying taxes for that thing, so you know I should be concerned how the money is spent. But now I've got grandkids in the community, and that was money well spent. So it's just this thing that goes around, and, and uh, so the transparency is important. And, that, and I... And that's what I want with this building. So you, you know, you can access the budget anytime. You can request a copy yeah. of the budget anytime. Yeah. So how much more transparent do you want us to be? Yeah. Well, the last request, things weren't wrapped up yet. Like at our yeah, at our meeting, we were still waiting for year end stuff to come in. So could we address the the chair? And then we'll ask the questions, just to keep things. Sorry. Okay. All right, go ahead. Yep. Thank you. Um, fourth bullet. Um, this is one that every council's tried to ignore uh, is alcohol. <coughs> I'm not saying the golf course is not going to succeed without it, but to succeed properly, it needs it. And whatever the process is to try and get it there, um, it needs to happen. Now, morally for me, I don't drink alcohol and I don't want to see it in our community but we have it in our community and anybody that denies that is is lying through their teeth whether it's alcohol drugs uh, opioids whatever it is it's in our community as much as we want to keep it out so um, I went through the plebiscite issue the question in the last council plebiscites are great except your questions they get watered down and it's hard for people to, you know, to, to say, do you want alcohol in town, yes or no? Well, that's a no-brainer question. If you ask the question, do you want our economy to improve? That should be a no-brainer question, too. And so it's a difficult question council has to deal with. Um, 
the new marijuana legislation. <clears throat> if somebody came to town, what Jeff told me, uh, the town council would have to consider allowing marijuana sales in Carson. Yes, they're in secluded areas, but we could we could legally have a marijuana sales depot in Carson without any question. And so my question is, to personally, and I'm against abortion, I'm against all these other rules the government's put in place, but why are we fighting this one so hard? Okay, do we want to hold that till the end or do you want to discuss it right now? Well, I think Elson it's important. Barnes. With the alcohol situation, Delbert, this came to us with the uh, Black Sands back at least four years ago. Well, I'm just saying at least four years ago. And we told them, you go right ahead and do what they're doing in McGrath. Get your, get your day licenses and stuff like that, and you go for it. But the, the group there, nobody wanted to take that initiative. After they asked us, they wanted the town to be the one responsible for doing it. We weren't running it. They were the association. So I think the same thing goes here, that your organization, whoever's running it, can still do the same thing. Okay. We haven't said, no, you can't do it. But it has to be a license according to the province. An event license is how McGrath always does it. They don't have just a, you know, open bar, but they have event licenses. And I think that's the way you handle it. It's a bit more complex than that, but yeah. I understand where you're coming from. Yep. Mary, you had a question? Uh, Councillor Bengal. Well, what I was going to say, the legislation is quite complex. We look into it. And we looked at all the level and all the hoops that needed to be jumped in order to get anything of that sort. But we also understood that unless you have a sense of the will of the people, and one of the plebiscite question was, would you want to, would you accept alcohol on recreation facility? And it, there was an overwhelming 75%, 79% against it in a community. So if anybody wants to try to change that leg legislation, you have to have a binding plebiscite. I doubt that five years later, you're going to have a very different result. I wish you well. Yeah. So my comment, Mayor, if the, if the majority of 75% <coughs> of Carson doesn't want alcohol on the golf course, why is it allowed there? This is an excellent question. Yeah. So, so I'm, what I'm saying is... It's a if, double standard. You're yes. absolutely right. Yes. I don't deny that. Yeah. But there are people who use the golf course and who want to have a day license in order for a... Whatever event they call they call their event, and that is allowed under the provincial legislation. Yeah, and that we know. Yeah, you you are right. It's a it's a form of double standard, but that is a way the province has allowed it yeah. in this part of the woods, which is a historical. Uh, <coughs> result of when there was a prohibition that yep. was put to a plebiscite, the southern part of Alberta chose to remain in a prohibition. Yep. Therefore, we are under that legislation. It's not as easy to change Oh, no, as I know it's not it. easy to change. I'm just saying that... No, so I understand. Got, yeah, there are two standards, yep. but the province is creating that monster. Yep. So you, you would go ahead with this building if or, irregardless if you get alcohol in there or not. Yep. I mean, it obviously would be easier because you can make more money with alcohol. That's, so this yep. is a question that could be addressed or try to be addressed <coughs> or pushed through. Oh, yes. Yeah. No, I, ju I just make note of it here because I, I want council to be mindful. Right. I understand yeah. that. I think we are. Councilor Bangry. Council, I think we need to, to listen to the whole presentation. This is a brand new committee that's being struck. And uh, they're going to have some governance issues, and this kind of stuff can come out in their yep. in their policies and procedures in their governance Amen. model when they when they propose a business plan. Right. And so, I, Mr. Beezer, as far as I'm concerned, go ahead, do your presentation, and then let's open it up. Okay. 
Okay. Back to you. So the last thing is just the name of the association. Uh, we've narrowed it down to two names, Lee Creek Valley Association or Friends of Lee Creek Valley. Um, we feel like uh, having it like that rather than the word golf in the name would allow future fundraisers or future activities to be done under the association's name. Um, like many associations in Carson, we've had the the soccer field, we had the Schaefer's lights on the diamonds, and, and those associations are still in place, but are they active? They're not active, but they're still there to do things if they chose to. So we're still trying to narrow those down. So uh, I'd like council to give you my, your opinion, give me your opinion on, on the, either of those two names before we go ahead and file. Um, the second page uh, forecast thing I gave you was based on this year's 2019 rounds of golf, the revenue and expenses that Alex shared with me, Alex and Jeff. And uh, so my projections are based on the number of golf rounds. And yes, I know weather has an issue, weather has issues with that and there's other concerns, but uh, a golf course like ours shouldn't be, should be able to have up to 17,000 rounds a year. And there's very, very many variables on memberships and punch cards and green fees and all those things that you guys have access to those things. So uh, the one thing I have, have recognized and, and will suggest is uh, forecasting and analytical is truly based on data. And if the data is not correct, it's hard to really give some true numbers. So... I'm just basing these on the number of rounds of golf that the course could do. Uh, I just increased those percentages based on on what they were for 2019. The blue highlighted are essentially the, cl the clubhouse, the expenses and revenue, and we, they may be out a few thousand dollars. I talked to Alex this morning, and there's some things in miscellaneous that may not be part of that. There's some of the GST that I don't have up in there, et cetera, but... Um, I truly believe this can be profitable. I don't have any restaurant numbers in there. I don't have any alcohol sale numbers in there. This is just strictly on rounds of golf. So, and then also the, the other activities, the bowling if it's put in, the reality games, uh, the restaurant, the wedding, wedding rentals are a possibility uh, in the off season, those kind of things. It'll be part of that. So the other, the only other question that council may have, and, and uh, Jeff and I talked about it a little bit, is is the operation. So scenario-wise, we get the building built. The town's still operating the course uh, as planned. Um, the alcohol question, uh, when we get the building done and for 2021, uh, is council going to bring that question up if they're operating the golf course? Probably not. So the operation of that facility will need to be looked at. Uh, our, our vision on that is to rent the facility to a, to a restaurateur and let them run the pro shop, hire the people to be in the pro shop, and let them have control of that building. I, and so with an application, Jeff, there would probably have to be some, some type of an agreement struck with whoever the operator is. Because on a rental, I'm not sure uh, if the facility's rented, and I, I know, Jeff, I don't know how the McGrath one works, because <laughs> that's an anomaly, but um, the dart club accordingly gets the liquor license. So I've never been to a dart club, but anyways. Uh, so there's, there are some ways, I think, around the alcohol part. Uh, Raymond currently is, uh, Jeff mentioned, and I knew they were doing something, but they're forming a, a nonprofit organization to sell memberships, and that gives them their license to, but it's not on the course, I don't think. No, it's that. Yeah. Uh, it's the, the Elks, but Eagles. Eagles. The Eagles. The Order of the Eagles. Yeah. It's a brand new building they're building right up yeah. in there right now, yeah. So in reference to that membership question, too, um, <coughs> I would like to suggest the town change the membership to just an annual pass. I, if we form an association, we're going to be selling memberships to our association. I don't want them clouded with a golf pass because we're going to have members of our association that aren't golfers, I'm sure, and I don't want it being clouded. So, so you're suggesting association be an annual membership? Yep. Okay. 
And, and there may be something related to that. We could do the same thing that the Eagles are doing. I'm not sure. But, but uh, I think they're doing their license off course, aren't they, Jeff? Yeah, on a private facility. So if it's town-owned and leased to an individual, I don't know if that alcohol thing. But I, I just put this out here. These are points I feel like I need addressed and, and nailed down a little bit more before I register the name and start fundraising. Okay, well, we've got five or six minutes for questions. Councillor Banger, then the mayor. Delbert, I really like the concept you're on. Uh, I, I feel, as just my opinion, that when you come back to us with a governance model of this committee that you're working on, then we can suggest, and you can put that into your governance model, that this committee will maintain the operation of the golf course regardless of the uh, terms of office for, uh, for uh, council, and it can maintain this for how many years? You can put that into your policies. And then as a council, the now day council, we can accept or reject those and ask you for your opinion on changes. But I, I think we need to have some kind of a proposal. Tonight, you want to nail down a name. Yep. And I agree with you that it can't have golf in it. We want this a destination golf course. Yep. We have the course, but we don't have the other facilities for that destination part. Yep. And so if you, you call it the Carson Golf Course, the natural identity, that's for golf. Yep. That's nothing else. And like you said, we want another facility that we can host weddings, we can host family reunions, huge family reunions for, for whatever. And so we've got to take that into mind when we, we do this. If it's Lee Creek Association or Recreation Facility, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Madam Mayor? Or Lee Valley? I'm not going to talk about the, the name, although I kind of like your uh, proposal of being a community building rather than a golf club. Yeah. I like that. What I was trying to ask you is, Delbert, is regarding the projections that you have here. You have, the, <coughs> and honestly, I'm not a golfer, so uh, I can be educated. So the, the revenues increase by 31% over two years from what I see. But your expenses, from what I see, increase by about 10% over the same period of time. How do you justify that? So the only real adjustment, yeah, the only real adjustments I made on the expenses, because the, the golf course is built, uh, other than hole 16, <laughs> we won't throw that one in there. But the golf course is built, the maintenance of the golf course is being done now. Um, could it be better? I'm not sure. Miles did a great job last year. But there are things that could be improved. And so how do you budget those kind of material increases? Um, you know, they're, they're based on demands from the golfers, number one. Uh, and I don't know if the golf course even had any last year, Alex. I don't know if there were any demands of that type that said we want white grass or white sand bunkers and we demand that or... We want tee off boxes that are left mowed higher. I'm not sure, you know, of those kind of demands. But the material, the operation of the golf course as an 18-hole golf course now is not going to change that much other than increases to wages and materials. So you don't see the increase of the traffic on the greens as being a, a correlation for increased expenses towards the maintenance of the green? I, I don't. Anticipate I'm not there would a golfer, be. Yeah, like yeah. I tell you. I, I don't anticipate there would be any additional. That, that's just my, my thoughts on it. Um, that the increase in costs to operate a golf course or maintain a golf course, the weather has a lot to do with that. And I mean, Jeff can attest this year we have this terrible spring, you know, with the water and, and all of that stuff. And, and that drops your rounds of golf. But also, you're still paying your wages. So your costs. Your costs per day are up because you're not getting the maintenance done. So that's why I didn't increase those bottom numbers in proportion. Okay. Just, just yeah. 
I mean, I, in, I increased the fuel a little bit. I didn't increase the equipment because that's set as capital. Yeah. Uh, the machinery I increased a little bit, but that's, Alex just said that's the general operation of the repairs of the machinery, so. Um, we will be looking at, a, this is my concern, I'm not concerned, but an added expense that the way you're de presenting this, is we'll need a year-round operator for that building. I, I, would, I would hope that's, that would be my hope. Town that, employee, or is that yeah. going to be? Well, and that's that's what has to be determined by committee. by council. Like that's an extra whatever for the town. Yeah, expense. yeah. As an association, I and I'm not against the Black Sands Group, but I I think that there was the agreement wasn't tight enough. Maybe there wasn't enforcement of the agreement, and so there wasn't expectations being met. In my opinion. Uh, and so the, the agreement for whoever's operating it would need to be a little tighter. Yeah. Okay. And so with the clubhouse, it could be ran as a separate, you know, similar to the ice center restaurant and the, and the skate sharpening booth. Yeah. You know, that could be set up separately as a, with the town, I believe. Things that we can work on. Councilor yeah. Brown. Um, just a question in regards to your first bullet, ownership of the project. So I understand where you're going with this. So the thought that um, in a couple years when this council is done and a new council is being put in, you're fearful. What? I know, right? <laughs> you're fearful that maybe they won't support this idea because that happens, right? Yep. I mean, every four years we get a new, yep. a new goal of council. And so, pending who's sitting at this table, that goal changes dramatically, yeah. or not at all, just depending on the people that sit at this table. But I just, uh, my question isn't so much about that, it's more so of, so your committee that you're going to have, um, is your goal is to get the funds for the building and to start the project and and build it yep. essentially correct yeah yep. and you want you want sole um say in all of that yeah however if you have any questions or you're short on money or anything you'll come to us well i would hope we're not short on money but but you know what i mean but if there's questions of council the same way back well, you're that gonna have, so you're going to have two or three councils sitting on that committee that's in charge of the construction. Yeah. So then they would return and report just like we do on all of our other committees. Yeah, yeah. yeah and the, so the ownership has two, there's a long-term ownership thing and there's short-term. For me, it's the short-term. Getting the building built and finished. Yeah. Get it, getting it built and finished. The, we have the ribbon cutting that now belongs to the town. Okay. After that, the town's, it's their building. Uh, they can decide how they want to operate it. Because the reason I bring this up is when we built the soccer field, I was a part of that, mm -hmm. and we raised the funds, we worked with the county, where we worked with the town, we together put it all together, had our builders, did all of that, but at no point was the Cardston Soccer Club, did we have ownership of it. We just worked hand in hand with the town, and at the town, our CAO was Marion Carlson, and we had a great rapport with the council and her. And so she helped us. There was no yours and mine, I guess. And maybe we were naive and we should have nailed down a few more things, but that worked really well with us. Mm -hmm. And so your hope is that us sitting on your council, whoever that is of council, that we will have that back and forth and it won't be a problem, yeah. no, matter, no matter who is the president of yeah. your association. Yeah, e either way. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, uh, Talbot, I just want to come back to the building mm -hmm. of that. Because if you are the one building, where is a town say as to the code at which the building is being done? So that's done through the building permit process. Done through the provincial building process. Yeah. So we would we would apply for a building permit to the or de development permit, I guess you call it, to the town, and then a building permit has to be taken out through Park Enterprises, I believe, in the town, and uh, along with the sewer and plumbing and electrical, all of those permits have to be taken out. Yeah. So the building is not going to be. Uh, 
It's not going to be an outhouse built by a bunch of farmers. <laughs> you know, it'll be up to code. I just want to make yeah. sure. I mean, in. we've been burned in this town. Yeah. Let's put it this yeah. way. Yeah. So yeah. I don't want to be burned again. Yeah. No, no, it'll to be. To end up a year later to have something that requires then taxpayers' dollar to yeah. fix yeah. what was not done properly. Yeah. And so my question is just preemptive. Yeah. No, and my intent is not to start the building until the funds are in place. I'm not going to say I've got $100,000, so we're going to dig the basement, and there the basement sits for a year because I can't raise any more money. Good. So Good. I, I want to have the funds in place before the building seems even started. Any questions on this side of the... One more, I guess. I've just got a comment. I, I, I have to concur with the mayor because I was on the building committee for the, for the library, and, and when they turned it over to us... We saw all kinds of problems, and uh, it was it was tough. Tough. The permits slugging. were taken. And the permits were all there, and everything was in place, but nobody would take the responsibility, and it cost us money to do a lots of repairs on the air conditioning, the heating system, the HVAC, and all that kind of stuff. So I I concur with you exactly what you're. Right. I have those same concerns. Yeah. Make sure that they're done by code and reputable contractor, etc. And uh, yeah, one more comment from Councilor Bengri. Uh, Mr. Bishop, have you had a question or are you making a comment? Because generally I'm people... i to make a comment in parallel with what he's saying. You're talking about, at one point, the operation of the clubhouse. The operation of that structure could remain with that association and yeah, a contractor to hired to run the building. That's so things we'll... That then is not part of the town. It's a contracted operation. These are things that can be worked out as, as yeah. this process yeah. goes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah, generally the gallery doesn't speak, but that's okay. okay. Councillor Bangry. Again, I want to reiterate, uh, Delbert, uh, I, I think about Henderson Lake. Henderson Lake is fully operated by their memberships. They have an association. You buy a membership into it. You have the right to vote, to, to act as a, an officer in that club. They, they, they hire their uh, golf pro and so forth. In the fall, the city comes in, blows their lines out, their water lines, uh, looks at their trees for tree trimming and so forth. And there's a certain amount of work that the city is obligated to do. But in all in all, Henderson Lake is operated by the, by the membership, the association. Yeah. And I and again, I think if you went back and sat down and said, "I want this many committee members, get your committee struck, your your structure of your committee, yeah. and then present that to us, let us have a look at that, and we'll give you the go to run." Okay. <laughs> All right, Mr. Beezer, I want to thank you for a very good presentation. It's a great thing you're doing. We're all very aware of the that that the golf pub house is not exactly where we want it to be right now. Yep. Apparently there's one more question, and then we'll move on. I just wondered if we were going to settle on a name. That's what you... I don't need that tonight. I, I've, still, I've still got to make up the charter and everything, so... Fine. Thank you for your yep. passion. Just like your input. Very yep. much. Thank, very you. Good Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Okay, we have one more delegation. Mr. Tobin Woods wants to come and talk to the committee concerning some concerns he has when encountering trying to sell land within the town itself. So, uh, Mr. Wood, it's all yours. I just said to collect my thoughts before I come and talk here, but as I'm thinking... Yet, yeah, just... And I'm sort of all over the place, so I'm thinking, but I just want to just tell you, not necessarily my personal opinions or what I think about taxation and stuff like that, but just feedback from <coughs> potential buyers that are looking at properties. Um, and... They like I'll give you an example not example not trying to specifically talk about someone's property, but someone wants to build a large home and a large shop, and they would prefer to be in town, and they look at the cost of building that home and a large shop and maybe like putting a barn or something, so they're they're like an acreage in town, and they're they're gonna look they're looking at it and they're like how much am I gonna get taxed on this place, and it's quite it's quite high if they um, if they're in town or if they're in the county 
Um, I got people in the county that have their places for sale where I've actually had people and the town where they have have not bought the property because of the tax amount. I'm not saying it's too much different in like uh, Raymond, but it is different in other places like maybe Pincher Creek or um, Willow Valley. Um, so I'm not saying there's something, go ahead. Oh, no, no. I do your presentation you and we'll get to have the council. Yeah. So, um, yeah, the biggest, the biggest thing is, is I want to give them information. So I called Jeff the other day just to ask him a little bit about outbuildings. Cause I know in the County, um, if someone's property, they, they, they're a farmer, rancher, and they have agriculture, their outbuildings are not taxed. I know that cause my outbuildings aren't taxed. Um, I talked to Morgan Stratty and after talking to Jeff, actually I was back and forth between Morgan and Jeff and, uh, Morgan gave me some information that I was actually sort of hopeful that I could pass on to clients and maybe I could tell you guys is there's, uh, the minister made an order. It's like uh, legislation that they're ta only, ta if outbuildings are assessed right now, they're only assessed at 30% <coughs> and the next every year they're going to go down 10% until they're not taxed anymore. That's if it's agriculture. So I asked uh, Morgan, you know, how does he know and what, what does he do? He's like, basically, if there's a tractor in the barn, I'm not going to assess that barn. Even right now, he says he's not going to assess it. Now that's in the county. And I don't know for sure in the town, but um, if it is in the next three years, outbuildings, if they're agriculture, aren't going to be taxed. So that was information that I found out that I could maybe pass on to clients. But um, Dennis, what are some of your experiences with people that are looking to build? And I honestly, uh, um, chairman, Mr. chairman. Yes. <clears throat> for me, um, I haven't had that conversation. I haven't had um, my clients complain too much about the taxes on outbuildings. Um, they look at what the town tax structure is and they make a decision based on that whether or not they're going to have a business in town or whether they're going to have it out of town. That's what we got the bypass road part in the county on either side. Mm -hmm. And so uh, and so it's pretty tough because in town we don't have big parcels of land for them to have what I foresee what you're thinking about mm -hmm. in town. And so... There, I don't know. There's acreages um, in town. But there are some down along. Like home oh, seekers. They're mostly out here on the, yeah. in the uh, light industrial yeah. area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so there's a specific, I can't talk here today. Yeah. Specific thing you're thinking of. Somebody's come to you, they're in town and they want to add. Oh, no, I'm just talking all the time when, like, you know, there's, there's a few people in town that have built, um, that have bought properties and they have built or are going to build gymnasiums attached to their house right and it's a part of their home and they just know they're going to tax whether in the county or the town but all the time people are talking about building a shop for personal use and if they're if they have like let's say 10 acres and they buy it in town and they build a shop let's say it's a, a rancher who's going to move to town and he has going to keep his ranch keep his agriculture practices going on but he's just going to move to town they're wondering and they've asked me in the over the years, like, am I going to get taxed on this? And I've always told them that they are going to get taxed on it because of how the, how it's currently being taxed for the, that owner that owns that property. But now if this new owner buys it and it's agriculture, I was, my question was, is, are, is, is someone is running an agricultural farm out of town and then still has a property of personal residence and saying. builds a, builds a shop in town. Yeah. My suggestion, Tobin, is if you have questions like that, guide your questions to the CEO because he'll give you the answer to all those questions. Yeah. And, we figured uh, that one out a bit today. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. That's basically, probably the best answer we can, that we can give you because really we have no control no. over the taxes. The CEO no, the has assessment. the rules and regulations. He knows what, what you can and can't I, do. <laughs> and if they have a concern, then they can bring it to... To, to Jeff, and then he can bring it to council, and then we can look at it and debate upon it and see, because there are different 
there are different land designations within the town, you know, light industrial. There are some uh, Cultural, there small are some. Uh, agribusinesses in town, like over on the, the, the southeast and the, the southwest, and they are looked at a little bit differently than mm -hmm. residential or industrial. And so that's probably the best place you can go. I, I, I would think that probably it might be better for you if you had those answers rather than trying to guess to tell them that. Yeah, I think I'm a little bit clear now, so was, that's one thing. But just uh, just to let you know, I'm not saying I'm not saying we should change it or anything that needs to be done necessarily because you know that's just the way it is. Someone builds a big home, and they're gonna, their taxes are going to be big more than yeah. someone who builds a two hundred fifty thousand dollar place. But I know for a fact that there's people that would that are are hoping to come to this to this area and have looked at properties and have turned them down because of the taxes, both on the business and residential. Just give you an example. So Calspell, if you build like a big home on 20 acres, your taxes are going to be different than if you build a big home on five acres. It's just the tax, just the way that they tax that property is different because it has 20 acres. And in, in the county, if you own over 10 acres, and you build an outbuilding, usually you have, you know, horses on your property and your agriculture, and so you're not taxed on that. In the town, there's there's 20-acre parcels that are for sale right now that if people wanted to come and build on them. Down there, 20 acres. Yep. Yep. Mm. And there's a lot of things that affect those parcels being sold because of services, but there are people that look at it and like, hey, if I could have a place... Like for instance, over looking the golf course, I could build a build a having riding arena, and I could, like maybe they would or wouldn't because the agrodome's there. But they've talked about it. I could build a riding arena. I could have a build big house, and I could and I could live in that location. They're not going to choose that location based on what their taxes are going to be. So I'm just giving you information. I just had one more thing about businesses, but go ahead and no, no, no. you finish then. We'll talk. Yeah. We'll discuss. Yeah. So, so this is just an idea that I, that I'm, I'm wondering about. Like I've been in other municipalities, and maybe you can think of some too. Like a street sweeper that does the sidewalks for um, the on the main streets in front of the businesses. Like I own a downtown business, and my taxes are going to go up this year because I purchased the building last year, and they went up. The purchase price was higher than the previous owner paid for it, and so. Like I talked to Morgan, he's just, just the way it is based on your purchase price, even though your the purchase of your building is not greatly affecting the overall price, it's substantial enough that your taxes are going to go up. So I'm like, okay, my taxes are going to go up. What what do I um, get for those services, like a sewer and garbage and fire and police and ambulance and all that stuff? But uh I also have clients, like a one client in particular, that they pay twenty-seven thousand dollars tax to the town, and they're they have a big property, and and um, of, and it's understandable that their prices, their taxes are that that much. But in other in other buildings where I'm trying to sell in in Cardston, people ask, why doesn't the town sweep the streets? So that's just one thing I'm asking and wondering about is. Like for me, for instance, I pay fourteen hundred bucks to have someone clean or I, to to uh, shovel the snow every winter. Well, we do have street cleaners that do clean the streets. Yeah, but uh, what about the your sidewalks? Your properties, uh, sidewalks. That's always been the responsibility of the, of the owner. Yeah. Same, I have to shovel my sidewalks. That yeah. Yeah, everyone does. Even though the town plows on top of them every once in a while, I still clean them. <laughs> yeah. That's just that's just being part of a, a community. I don't think the town should be responsible for cleaning everybody's sidewalks. I'm not saying the town should be responsible. I'm just thinking, could there be a reason why that we would do it? Like, let's say, like, for instance, my taxes are going to go up $400, right? And I'm not complaining, and I don't want to special, be treated special. But I'm thinking of reasons that I would be totally fine paying more taxes, and those that would be one of them. Yeah, I think because I pay fourteen hundred dollars for someone to come sh shovel, make a so special you want, trip. You want to add a little more to your tax and have a, at the town do it for a cheaper rate. 
Well, yeah, I'm not saying it. I, I, I would be willing. They would, they would cover yeah. the whole Main Street, whoever. Yeah, doing. like, yeah, I think, I think so. I think if, okay. like, the cost from the fourteen hundred dollars that I spend, if there was ten businesses, you know, that fourteen thousand dollars, I don't know if it would cost the town <coughs> that much to I do. Can't ask yeah, I don't know. Just an idea. Sorry, just three. trying to understand this. So, so you're, he, he kind of brought up my question, but so you're going to have to pay $400 more a year on your taxes. And so your question is essentially, what am I getting for that? If, I'm, if my taxes are going up more, why aren't you cleaning my sidewalks? Why aren't you taking better care of me? Mm, sort of. the thought. So, so if now... Yours has gone up $400. If we went to every business on Main Street, and we've got some open holes there too, right? But if we went to every owner on Main Street and said, your taxes are now going to go up because we're going to clean your sidewalks. I can think of a couple of them that I know personally that would say, <laughs> I will clean my own Why sidewalks and keep paying what I'm paying. Yeah, I just used it as an example because I didn't want to stay specific to certain people, but I... I have, I'm just giving you feedback. I have people that come to the town yeah. and they want to buy properties and they're looking at, I'm taxed. Uh, look at the tax yeah, amount. So, personally, so I am using my broad. personal example just to, just to sort of narrow it down. To, to, to how, how across is that? Yeah, like okay. there's people that look at the taxes and they're like, w what, do I, what am I getting? At? I'm going to purchase this property and it's going to make it go up in price. And so my taxes are going to go up. Should I... Should I buy? That's one concern that they have is, is the tax amount. I'm just saying that my personal experience is I don't mind, and I understand I'm not especially treatment for my taxes to go up, but I, I do see that there's also a need for the street sweeping because there's so many people that pay private people to do them that it's, and it's, it gets pretty costly that I'm just giving you examples of... Yeah. Hey, uh, lots of comments coming here. Councilor yeah. Bengri and Councilor Barnes. And I've had, I've had a hundred different thoughts go through my mind, believe yeah. it or not. But, but Tobin, let's talk about the tax situation and large property taxes. Yeah. So okay. Richard Bengri comes to Cardston. He builds a 14,000 square foot home, huge home. And then he builds another 10,000 square foot shop on it. And I use that shop strictly for storage of my cars, vehicles, trailers, whatever. Then I die. My kids sell that property to John Doe. Yeah. John Doe comes into town, buys that property, uses a house identical to what I did. But in turn, he takes that shop and it turns it into a commercial <coughs> outlet by he's renting it out to, yeah. to Joe Blow's repair shop. Now, the, the land use designation has changed. The designation of that, that property has changed. Yeah. And you've got to be aware <coughs> of that, that this council is aware of those kind of things when the assessor walks in. He's assessing it at that day for what it's being used at. Not not five years down the road of what it mm. is being used at yeah. because times change and yeah. usage changes. Yep. <coughs> so we set our taxes according to the usage. What is what is being used right now mm -hmm. in in the different de designated areas? So oh. Councillor Barnes, when he suggested that if you have questions like that, you need to go to our CAO. And you need to say, this day is what we're being charged at taxes because of the usage and the, and the designated of the yeah. land. Yeah. You, you can't tell us what it's going to be used at in five years from now. That's right. Who's next? I forgot. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I think the mayor then me. Okay. I, I was going to say, um, we have, as a council, been extremely conservative. Absolutely. With taxes. If you really look at the mill rate over the past seven years, you will see we're pretty well flat. Which I think means you're that we good. have done more. I actually more, think you're pretty good on the business taxes for sure. Which means we have done more with less. The problem that we have in our town is 85% of the taxes are borne by the resident. 
<coughs> like me, who just have a house in town. Yeah. 15% is born by the uh, business. We're not a pincher creek where the, uh, the industrial and commercial mm-hmm. base is 40% and 60% is born by the resident. Yeah. So we are a little bit unique in that sense. And yes, is that uh, the best environment for business? If you compare it to towns that have a higher industrial base, mm-hmm. we, we don't compare well. I agree with you. But it's difficult for us to change uh, the tax structure, yeah. except according to what the assessor tells you and what the mm-hmm. town may inform you with. Yeah. Know. You know, I, I wish I wish we we could say to everybody, reduce your taxes by thirty percent next year. Hey, Crum, I will be the first one in line. <laughs> <laughs> but what happened? Okay, so I just wanted to kind of make a, a comparison. I know people who have moved in from Raymond and, and McGrath, and the taxes are fairly similar. But in Raymond McGrath, they don't have the sidewalks. They don't have the curbs and gutters. I know of businesses that you might as well call their street Pothole 1 and Pothole 2. Yeah. And they don't have the, the streets that we have. And so that's what the taxes are really covering. Those, those are privileges that you get with the taxes that you pay. Now, if somebody came to me and said, hey, you know, I've got this business in, in, in McGrath and it's going to cost you $15,000 to for the taxes there, you're going to be on this dirt road, (coughs) gravel road. Um, Maybe every two years they put some chemical on the road so you don't have the dust. We have some dust stuff. Or you can have this same building in Cardston. You're going to pay the same amount of tax, but you're going to have a paved road and and all that kind of stuff. And possibly you're going to have it paved right up to the the, uh, doorway. Where am I going to go? I'm going to pay that tax and I'm going to come here. But that's not... Every, that's not always like that. Mm-hmm. But I'm just saying that, like the mayor said, we can't compare to places like Pincher Creek or other places that not only do they have an industrial base, they have underground oil lines and gas pipelines are getting linear taxes up the yin-yang linear. that we don't get. Mm-hmm. And I know that if you t- want to look at that, you look at Raymond, I know what they're, they're getting uh, quite a substantial amount of linear taxation. We're getting a pittance. We're getting about 10% of what they get. And yeah. so, like the mayor said, we wrestle with this every budget. <clears throat> we just finished our budget. And, um, and it's pretty tough. And it's really tight. And we have to do what we have to do with the little that we got. And do I like it? I pay, I pay taxes here, too. And do I like how much I pay? Absolutely not. You know, when I first bought my home in the in the West End, and I haven't, I've done some differences on that. I had an outbuilding on it, but my my taxes were like five hundred and eighty dollars. Now I'm about eighteen hundred dollars in you know within within sixteen years, and they've over, over tripled. Have I got any more services than I had then? No, I don't. But I'm grateful that I have sidewalks. I'm grateful I have sewer. I'm grateful that my my street gets plowed. And, but I feel, for, I feel for the business guys because I am one. Mm-hmm. I know. I feel exactly the way. And I have these conversations also. But, boy, it's, it's tough. It really is. Well, we'll hear from another business guy right here. <laughs> I just wanted to clarify just some of the comments that you made. And, Jeff, you can keep me in check if I'm off <laughs> line. But, Good. Thanks. Um, you said that your taxes are going up $400 this year, but your building was assessed higher. So I don't think it's actually your taxes that are going up, but it's the assessment on your building. Mm-hmm. Same, same with yours, yep. same with my house. My, my assessment on the house that I have may have been assessed at $200,000, and now it's $250,000. Because I purchased it for more, the assessment's going up, so right. the taxes so, are going yeah, up. That's so it is. The, yeah. it's not the taxes, it's the assessment on your I'll building. I'll be paying more taxes this year. Yeah, you know, that's I'm just, the bottom line. Yeah. You know, it is, but I'm just saying that our mill rate hasn't changed for, for sure, a yeah. long time. Yeah. So it's, well, that, well, sorry. No, it's more your assessment, the value of your your building than it is. It's My last comment on street streets, streets, <coughs> okay, street thanks. sweeping. Mistakes. <laughs> we'll get this out here. Um, I would suggest if you're if it's a concern of all of Main Street, 
you contact your neighbors and come up with some kind of an idea and okay. hire somebody to do the whole thing. I don't think the town's going to get into the business of cleaning streets for an extra couple of hundred bucks on taxes. Just my idea, but anyhow. Any other questions for okay, thanks. Mr. Wood? We appreciate you coming and bringing I just wanted concern. to give you information. You know, we, I wasn't we don't, really trying we to... We that. sit as council and sometimes we just don't quite understand what the various businesses are thinking or what they would like. So I really appreciate you and anybody else that business people that come in and bring those concerns to us so it's actually right now more than ever i've had more commercial activity not a ton of sales there's a few and there you know of people that are coming to town and different things but um you know it's, it's something that someone like i don't want to say names but just people of buildings and properties that i've sold that's a big, big concern and some people have not done it because the taxes and just want to let you know mm. yeah like I have acreages in town that people will not buy because if they build on them, they're going to Your concern then is the size of the acreage and then they tax the all buildings. Mm -hmm. So we do have, what, 10 or 20 of them that might be fit that category in town? Sure, so yeah, you're, you're worried yeah. about that. That'd have to be something that, <coughs> yeah, as a taxation. But I, but we did find that out. So I just wanted to give you that information okay. that we found about ag buildings. So at least they're, if they're in the county, like there's some people that don't run agriculture and they build an out building, they're going to get taxed on it. And it might even be more than in town. I don't know that for sure. Yeah. I know on businesses it would be. But. All right. Thank you. Thank okay. Thanks. 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 Oh, okay. Let us move on. Uh, point five, the adoption of the minutes. Can we have somebody adopt the minutes from the December 3rd, 2019 CCW, Councillor Bangry? Any comments on them? Any corrections we need? All in favor? Any opposed? Thank you. Bylaw and policy, draft council policy L-10-2 policy for land sale. I think uh, Jeff was going to speak to this. Um, so last time we met, we were having some discussion around uh, the, the securities that we were going to request of developers in their development agreement. And then a couple things came to light since the last meeting. At the last meeting, we were directed to go back and have a, uh, a cash security of some kind when we're going to inherit infrastructure. And so we had some debate about what that should look like because you can imagine that imposing 100% value might be incredibly cost prohibitive to a developer. So if we're going to inherit a road, sewer, water line, well, are we going to request uh, $250,000, $300,000 in cash up front? That could be difficult. But what, what I realized and what Nolan uh, explained and was that the MPC already has a discretion to request security. Right. And they have in the past. In fact, he told us about a small property up here where they requested $2,000. It was a very small one because the risk was quite limited. So what we put in, in this draft uh, policy was that essentially for invest or developments which request which we're going to develop infrastructure that we would be inheriting, that security was required. So you're, what it would be doing is taking away the discretion of the MPC whether or not they're going to charge it. They are, if you pass this, by the way. They are, but the discretion is with them as to how much because we're concerned about prescribing it because I can't tell you the exact scale of the investment. Mm -hmm. So to say that it must be $50,000 and yet they're only doing a chunk of sidewalk is going to be onerous. But then to also suggest that it should be, you know, 50% of the total value of the infrastructure might in the other way be onerous. So it's not a perfect system. What, what this policy, and it's in red on your policy, by the way, what it would be saying is that we will charge <coughs> security for infrastructure and the MPC then will have to negotiate in the development agreement, the perceived risk of the town for that developer to execute the job and how much security would be required. So that's, it's, it's almost oversimplified in the policy. It just was an addition that says we're gonna charge security. So I just wanted to throw that out to see if we were comfortable with that or, or where you wanted to go with that. Okay, so crazy question for me, cause I ask a few of them. Um, <laughs> so it's a security deposit. Once we're satisfied with everything is done, that's it, they get it back. Yeah, we would need to determine in the development agreement how long to hold it. Because, for example, I'll use, uh, well, I'll, I'll publicly use Third Street West in this example. We inspected the water and sewer lines, and they were fine, and we took them over. And then when we went to do connections, the connections were improper. 
So that came up a little bit later. So, but we've also we, we're much more robust on our um, infrastructure transfer processes now. So because of that, we've really amended that. So that shouldn't happen again. There shouldn't be anything that gets to us that wasn't inspected. Okay, I see. Like that should go away now. So we we even have heightened security just in the inspection process. Um, but but yes, we would say before they transfer to the town. Um, this has to be done. If the owner chooses not to do those things, we pull that security and do it. I got you. Okay. Councilor Drew. So, Jeff, will there be um, a formula for a security? So if it's a $150,000 job, or is it going to be the committee that decides? Like right. More? Great, great question. I don't have an exact okay. answer because that's what we're wrestling with. So Nolan was saying, for example, uh, and this is where it's really tricky. It's obviously more cut and dry and more defensible if it's a formula. It's the same for all. However, you inherit a bunch more risk depending on the nature of the installation. So the installer, <coughs> the ground they're working in, the time of year they're doing it. You inherit a whole bunch more risk depending. So we're struggling with that because we don't want the formula to prohibit someone's development either. So it's a really tricky one. Um, well, can I, can I just finish? Yes. Sorry. Um, so I, the only reason I ask about a formula is because if that group makes a decision and somebody only has to pay this much yep. and then the next guy comes along yeah. and has to pay this much, yep. then from our perspective in the town, we're not being fair. Consistent. You know, I, I so agree that, with that concern. I agree. Okay, Councillor Moore. My concern. Yeah. Um, I, w I was just going to mention, whenever... Uh, Okay, in, in Cardston, you have several, several different soil types depending on the location, okay? Those soil types are dependent upon somebody doing a test. And then when you have certain soils, like up on the East Hill, you have lots of gravel. <coughs> Compaction is really easy to get. <coughs> then you come to the west end of town it's where clay. you have silt and yeah. clay. Yeah. Compaction is very difficult to get. So they've got to add gravel or whatever they have to do, a riprap or anything to get some compaction in that soil. So depending on where you are is where the negotiation comes in for a security deposit. Because if it's up the west end of town in certain areas, you can have real muck and real problems getting compaction to put that in. Right downtown here when we did the, the library, it was awful. It was like a quagmire underneath there, and they had to dig all that stuff out. We had to put rock. The contractor was shocked when they saw what was there. It was like you put a house on there, it would sink without anything done. So it, it all depends on what it, what's out there, and our town, Brandon's going to have to be right on top of that when it comes <laughs> to development to make sure that there's a compaction test done on it wherever they're building. And I think to be transparent that... Brandon needs to probably chat with the, or, or Nolan, chat with the person who's going to build and say, well, are you aware of these issues in this particular area so that they can make a better choice of, mm -hmm. of maybe where they're going to go? So that's just a concern that I have from the real estate side of me. Yeah. So. Okay. Yeah. I, I was thinking while you were talking, to me it talks a little bit of a risk assessment. But the, the issue is how, how well are we or are you as administration uh, able to administer a risk, risk assess, assessment? It's, so you have this other end of it where we say, well, you, we have to have an engineer provide all this mitigation assessment. Well, that's probably a it's five, six, eight thousand dollar touch, right, to do that. <coughs> And so, you know, when you start <coughs> looking at off-site levies and you start looking at development costs and you and start looking at all that, some, boy, yeah. things can add up in a hurry. So there's this balance of being prohibitive but mitigating the town yeah. risk, right? Exactly. And it's, I wish it was 25 percent the right answer, Councillor. I'm just not sure that it I is. Yeah. Uh, are there any towns that have something in their policy that we could 
check? So we have seen where it, it's a variable thing. So I'll give you an example. We reached out, uh, who did I talk to? I talked to Nobleford. That was one where, depending on the risk, they just had a development where they required 100% in cash. Right. So that's and then saying. others where they saw no risk and there really wasn't anything. It, so we saw that they were, they, because Kirk was telling me about how they had this development, they were really concerned about it, and they only let them proceed provided they put up 100% of the infrastructure value in cash, and they did. There you go. So it proceeded based on the business case of that party. I don't know anything about the business, but you can see how 100% of the value of the infrastructure would prohibit other developers. Hmm. That's right. Oh, Jeff, this is this has haunted the town of Carson for years. Is how do you get a developer to develop infrastructure according to the town's requirements? And I don't know if we need to have a policy in place that you adhere strictly to that policy, and you're inspected every every two feet or ten feet. Or whatever, but it seems like our developers will come in, and and it and it's it's a mind thing. They can save a thousand dollars if they put in a different kind of pipe and so forth like that. It's still up to specs. It's still that three quarter line or whatever, but it's just a different grade, or or they they don't have to bury it so deep. They don't have to compact it. I don't know. I think do we need to develop a policy which strictly outlines exactly what is required of that developer? So those, those things are generally in place, but what's happening is there's no, um, not much recourse for not following. So for example, I'll use third again. We should have been on site to see the burying of the connections. Right. But we weren't. So we took the engineer's report that it was all done and we moved on. But we should have said, dig it up, let us look <coughs> Yeah. Right? That, that's what has to happen because we needed to inspect it before it was buried. So those processes are more robust than they were even a few months ago. Right? That's happening. Brandon's getting up, you know, getting those more robust. And we have standard as far as what's the type of pipe, what's the size of connection, you know, all that is already, we mimic the city of Lethbridge spec is what we do. Yeah. So we piggyback on city of Lethbridge. So an another comment, uh, based on what uh, what you were saying about Nobleford. There's desirable areas for certain developers too. Close to transportation hub. Yeah. Nobleford's very close to the rail, rail line if they need, that developer needs that. We don't have that anymore, right? But we're looking at trying to develop a 24-hour port. If we ever get that 24-hour port here, then that's going to open up some business opportunities to our community. Once that happens, you're going to see a lot of different changes going on um, because the truckers will be able to come in here. They'll have the infrastructure. They'll be able to do a lot more than what they're doing now. So why do developers choose to go to places closer to Lethbridge or go to Fort McLeod or Nova for those places? Because they have, the, they have the infrastructure. We don't. And until we get something that's going to work for our developers and our business, we're, we're going to be toughing it out, as we have for so many years. Okay, so where and do we go from here? We keep pushing the 24-hour port well, and helping Councilor like Sell get that thing done. Councilor Vangry. <laughs> uh, Jeff, is there a simple thing, a policy that, or a statement made that before you bury your infrastructure, that it needs to be, it has to be, or inspected by the town. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry. Um, and then you can bury it, we don't care. Right, so that would be part of the development, the development yeah. permit, right? That would be part of that. Excuse me again. <coughs> so those are the kind of per things that are negotiated, and that's the thing. Each of these is negotiated at the time, so it isn't boilerplate. Yeah. And you can even see in this policy, it's insert this if this. Right. Yeah. Use this paragraph if this. Yeah. Right. Because they're, they're not strictly boilerplate. And, and I guess what, by just putting that addendum in the policy, the question really is, are you comfortable with letting MPC negotiate those details at the time of development? If you're not, then, then let's make it a something more prescribed. Well, having sit on the MPC board, I'd have rather whether it's something more prescribed okay. than us sitting down exactly. saying, well, let's charge this guy this much and this guy that much. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel the same agree. way. Or he's putting in the I would rather the right see it more prescriptive. Line, the, yeah. 
right specs. It'll be easier so for the town. So is this a, a, where we need to give administration some direction, direction to make some suggestions on a policy change? Well, this thing's been open policies? now for a while, and that's fine. So I, I, I'm just collecting your feedback here. Okay. So what I'm hearing is instead of just having this generic that leaves it to the MPC, something that is prescriptive, that finds a balance of protecting the interests of the town but not prohibiting the development, right. and we're going to have to do a bit of a general assessment risk yeah. community-wide yeah. here. I'm more comfortable as a member of the MPC. Okay, and I appreciate that perspective as a member of that committee, yeah. yeah. So we will, we will talk to some communities, we'll talk to Old Man River Planning again, and we'll see if we can find... Uh, a more prescriptive, which maybe I just put a note here that it is a percentage up to an amount. Yeah. Um, so maybe there is a cap overall, so that it doesn't completely uh, blow a project out of the water, right? Yeah. And know that as everything is no problem, they get that money back. Uh, absolutely, and maybe maybe the d inspection process needs to be a little more prescribed, yeah. so that they have some security in that as well. Yeah. So okay, no, that's great. That's all I wanted was a little feedback on that. Do you have anything else? Uh, no, I was just saying, in, in respect to the formula, I don't have to have a formula, but I just wanted something in place that would help MPC make a decision that's yeah. fair across the board to everyone, right? Yeah. Kind of yeah. And, and it may not be just a simple percentage. It may be this. These are the items to be reviewed. Yeah. This is how the, it's weighed. The formula will be weighed. We can look at something like that. Okay. Sounds good. Okay, thank you. Okay, bylaw policy, bylaw 1673, the one we've all been waiting for. Cannabis control bylaw. <laughs> this has to do with the cookies, I'm assuming that's what so, we're so yes. um, so let, let me pull this up on mine. All, all we're asking here, you'll recall last meeting you got a letter from Alberta Health yeah. requesting that municipalities extend their prohibition of cannabis. Uh, hold on, let me grab my notes here because I was writing it down. Of cannabis um, edibles and extracts similar to the prohibition on uh, combustibles, smoking. Yeah. And they had a variety of reasons in there. And so when we looked at our cannabis control bylaw, we used an interesting uh, word, uh, whether intentionally, I don't know how much foresight we had there, but section 5, where it says, no person shall smoke, vape, or consume cannabis in any public place. So then it begs the question, what does it mean to consume? Yeah, so it's a and so my thought here is at first I thought we need to put a bunch of stuff in about edibles, but potentially we just need to define consume. Consume, consume. Yeah. yeah. Now, I have another question just to complicate it a bit for you, though. In the Alberta Health document, they said they're dealing with edibles, extracts, and topicals. Right. Okay, so things embedded with cannabis that you eat, extracts such as uh, high-potency oils and things like that, and then topicals, lotions, creams, those kind of things. Topicals actually normally have no, um, what's the word, intoxicating properties. They don't have that property to them. They're simply, uh, so they're not something that would cause you to become, right. you know, compromised right. or inebriated, yeah. right? So my thought was, would we actually want to try and prohibit the use of topicals? Uh, so my own opinion is I'm not sure that, because I'm not sure what the public safety reason for it is. Yeah. That's what I would question. Oh. We don't want to step into the medical marijuana field either. Well, it's, if it's prescribed, okay. we've stepped into it to the point we're saying you can, uh, sure, anyone can have it, but you can't consume it publicly at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's where we've stepped into it to this point. Yeah, and I would suggest, at least Alberta Health would suggest, you step into it in that same area for consumables. Okay. You can have them, you can use them, but you can't do them publicly because it normalizes consumption of a dangerous product. That's the rationale. Yeah, I was just going to say. The, the, uh, you, you've got to be careful with the uh, medical stuff because the doctors here are prescribing stuff for people and and uh, I've talked with some people who do use them. They don't use them to get high. They use them to alleviate pain and, mm -hmm. and, and difficulties. And they said nothing bef before they had this, nothing worked. Yeah. And now they, they're living normal life, lifestyles. And so I'm thinking, yeah, as long as it's a medical thing and it's prescribed, and they're not doing it on the street and open because that can lead to a problem. But they're doing it at home. Yeah, it's taking so, care of their, their medical needs. So AHS is not proposing you are prohibiting consumption 
in the community, Mu- just is. publicly in right. the community, right. right? Because it's just like with alcohol. We do not have a consumption prohibition. We simply have a reselling prohibition. And federally, there's a consumption public prohibition already. That's already a thing. Yeah, so don't bring your cookies to the basketball game. Yeah, right. <laughs> So the question is, does council feel comfortable if we draft a definition of consume? I think it's a good idea. Yeah, I think so. To consume means to participate in the consumption of edibles or uh, extracts. That no one we have, yes. Which have the ability to cause intoxication, da-da-da-da-da, that kind of a thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's what would be the the intent. And then we've got that covered off okay? Okay, well, if that's, we'll proceed with that and bring you back a draft with a, with a definition of consume. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Other business. Jill's going to speak to us about a property assessment issue. Um, we're not going to mention any names. Yeah, if we just use the addresses here and talk about the options, and then we'll engage with the uh, property owner. Yep. Okay, so hopefully you've all had a chance to look through the background or document. Um, How this has come up is that we had an audit done of our assessment process. And so it was a a matter of looking at what we do in our offices as well as what Morgan does with his assessments. And the auditor found uh, three properties in town that are good-sized lots, 70 by 120, that um, at this point in time are um, valued at $920, which is our minimum tax rate for taxes on them. Um, the auditor questioned this, and as we looked into this, um, our assess, assessor, Morgan Stratty, he found that there was a something on their file dating back 20 plus years that was an override, basically, that left it at that minimum assessment. So to fix that, because we do need to fix that, that would mean a fairly significant increase on these properties, because services are are... Um, right nearby in two different locations. Um, And so that will cause a fairly significant impact to the property owner as far as taxes go, going from a minimum assessment and minimum tax rate to um, a regular lot in town, $50,000, $60,000, depending on on where that would come out at. Um, The assessor has let me know that if there is some kind of um, letter or... um, enforcement from the town through our land use bylaw, that's one of the options, on the property saying that it is only to, is to be used for parks or open space, that justifies leaving that assessment at a low assessment and there would really be not much impact to the property owner. So the reason why we're bringing this forward is to discuss some options just to kind of give council a head up, heads up on this um, and to discuss some of the options that we might have. So you've got the options listed there. The first one is to amend the land use bylaw to restrict the future development on there. So to make sure that it only stays as the park's open space. Um, And then again, very minimum impact, I would think on that assessment, it'd still fall under our minimum tax rate. Um, Another option would be to see if the property owner would give the land to the town um, for us to then make it its town-owned property. We can do it with it what we want um, and turn it into that parks and open space. He maintains it as that right now. I think there's no intent on his part to um, develop it any further. Um, Another option would be um, to enter into a municipal tax waiver on there. Um, Not a great precedent for council to set, but it is an option you could look at. Um, And then we could purchase that land and then decide what we want to do with it or do nothing at this point and just let it be um, taxed at the full assessment and go forward. So it's just meant for council discussion to look at some options and then if we decide on one, how we would go forward from there. Okay, so door number one, two, three, four, or five. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for your presentation and to help us get the background. It's rather interesting, actually, to see something for 20 years was off the radar. <laughs> uh, my personal option for that property would be option one. I would uh, think that, I mean, $7,500 uh, per lot creates what kind of a, a tax bracket for him? That would About still be our minimum tax. Five, that's what I thought, mm-hmm. because you apply the mill rate, it's still, still there. Personally, I think 
that would be probably the option. The only thing is, I'm wondering, imagine that that uh, property owner were to pass away. Uh, is there a caveat that is put on those property for further uh, negotiation regarding the assessment of those property? Or the use of it, yeah. If I may, if council decides to change the land use bylaw to restrict those properties, it would be up if when the person passed away, the next owners could come and approach council to say, can I have this turned back? So it's just a matter of a bylaw change. Okay, are there any other people that want to speak to option one? Yeah. Option one. I prefer option one. Let's do Period. That's it. Okay. You're Jill, this has been going on for 20 years, right? As far as I'm aware, as far as my records go back to that what I can find. What prompted, it's just a, so just a question in my mind, so what, what, what prompted the government to come down and do a, a, a total assessment review? So it audit. Did it, we ask for that? If I made it, it was not asked for. It is something that is on a revolving basis that it hadn't been, um, we hadn't had an audit of our assessment um, practices, our processes for a while. It was due. And it just happened to be one of the <coughs> ones that, as he was looking through everything, it triggered. On the, on the last assessment audit, whoever it was that did it, they may not have found it. And so it, it's just come up now and we'd like to take care of it. Anybody else that uh, has a comment outside of option one? Go ahead. So just with, is this what's happening right now? Currently, <laughs> it, is this person paying $75 for each of those lots? It has been under the, the, the minimum assessment, yes, and that minimum tax. And you can see the picture on the next page if you want to. Yeah. So uh, is there any problems with this? Offer option one and away we go. Yep. So we'll engage with the landowner. If they disagree with that option, if they take exception to it, then we'll have them come and negotiate what yeah. they see fit at that point. Yeah. We just now have some direction to offer them. But this would not change it. anything of what, he, what he's doing right not now. Not financial implication. Yeah, shouldn't but see I a can't problem. Speak to their estate planning intentions yeah. or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. Okay, sure they don't want a dog park. So you'll be in communication with this individual and it's all good. Yes. Okay, sounds good. Anything else? Thank you. You need a motion on that? I think uh, Thanks, Joe. Okay. Um, we need a break for five, or are we good to go for the long? We didn't order dinner because we thought we'd be yeah. I, I'd like a quick break oh, myself. Just, uh, we don't have a whole lot left. So. Yeah, some oh, people's bladders. Uh, are uh, when you say a whole lot, uh, I've heard no, you no, say no. that before. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 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 I'll, I'll entertain a motion for a five minute break. I make that motion for a five minute break. All in favor? Thank do you. What you got to do. I know what your small. <laughs>